Ready for takeoff. All right, hopefully everyone's in the right place, uh, building a commercial game engine with Ruby. Um, right now, uh, the standard license for the game engine is available for free. You can download it. Just Google Dragon Ruby itch.io, and uh, you'll get a full commercial license. Use it for whatever you want. Make money off of it. Get a huge studio. Hire a bunch of people. Then buy the pro license. Right. That's the plan. Right. Okay. So um, uh, been in the game industry for I guess a decade now. Ten years. And uh, when, uh, when a game dev asks me, oh, yeah, I, I build all my games in, uh, in Ruby, uh, this, is the, uh, this is usually the question that I get. <laughs> and um, over, uh, over that time, I've, uh, I've fine-tuned the perfect response. Right. <laughs> and uh, usually that ends up, they usually walk away, or they, we start having a productive conversation. And, um, and say, ah, oh, but no, seriously, Amir, like, why would you do this? And um, the answer is actually pretty simple. I don't want to be miserable in building video games. I just, I've been coding for 23 years now, and I'm telling you, I don't want to use a programming language that is horrible and frustrating to use. So I just don't want to be miserable doing it. And this is the dream, right? You're, you're a kid, you're like, I want to build a video game. That's the way you get into coding. And then, and then you have to use languages that are not fun. And uh, I think Ruby gives you that perspective. Um, the other interesting thing about Ruby that makes it good for video games is that Ruby's art. When we talk about Ruby, we say, oh, it's a beautiful language. You hear that all the time. Who, who calls a language beautiful? It's expressive, right? It makes me happy. And there's, there's facets of that that correlate to art. It scares me. Yeah, some art can be kind of scary. Um, but um, I think that's, I think that's uh, intrinsic in the language itself. And um, one of the most important things is that Ruby begets innovation. Think about how just the past 25 years that Ruby's been around, how it's changed the landscape of technology and how we build software. Right? We would still be using Spring today if it wasn't for Ruby. Right? And um, that's... that's it's an important aspect to, uh, to what I think makes uh, Ruby so powerful, especially in the context of game development. And um, just to kind of show you the, this idea of uh, innovation, um, these aren't PowerPoint slides. This is actually the game engine running, running PowerPoint slides. <laughs> but we're going to do something better now. And, um, and here's the better thing. So this is built using using Dragon Ruby. Let me go in and um, I'll go ahead and change. Let's make the boat a little bit faster and its acceleration faster. The environment's hot loaded. Woo! I'll bring it back to regular speed. Um, Got a built-in REPL, so I can actually do one plus one equals two. I can uh, go back to a boring slide. Back at the beginning of my presentation. Okay, so this is what I mean by innovation. This is what I mean by the, the quality that, uh, that exists with Ruby and what is possible with the language. Okay, the game industry is completely utterly stagnant when it comes to their, uh, when it comes to their tool chains. And, um, and uh, what I've learned is that Ruby takes it to that next level. Makes what's, I've been told that's not possible. You cannot hot load your environment while retaining game state. And they see it and they're like, but it's not fast enough. And then I show them uh, Dragon Ruby rendering 20,000 sprites on the screen at 60 frames per second while Unity gets nine. And they're like, that's not possible. What about physics? And then I show them many-to-many -many collision of 1,500 objects at 60 frames a second while Unity gets one frame per second. And they still don't believe me. And, um, and we're going to go into a little bit of detail of how that's possible. Okay. 
So um, this is how the game engine started. And it always starts easy, right? How hard can this be? And um, so we have, a, we have a strong dependency on uh, SDL. SDL stands for Simple Direct Media Layer. And uh, it's completely battle-hardened, battle cross-platform multimedia library, okay? Um, the Valve Steam client is built using SDL. Your, your uh, mini consoles for SNES, P PSX, all those things are powered by SDL. Um, pretty much every commercial, like uh, large AAA games, large AAA commercial game engines are powered by this really crazy, amazing library. And uh, what you're seeing here is SDL's approach to cross-platform uh, creation of a window. All right, that's how it creates a window. Uh, create a window, 1280 by 720 for its resolution, Render a back, uh, show the window, render a black background, and present it. Okay. So that's how I started. I was like, sweet, I got SDL working, I can create a window on every platform. PC, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android, console. I have games on the Nintendo Switch that use Ruby. WASM. Um, Steam Deck, we got that support. So I have a window creating, but I have to do something with that, right? So how is Ruby involved in this? Um, MRuby is really, really amazing in this regard because it's embedded. That's what the M stands for. So I get, I get chipset architectures available to me through the compilation process, in this case, Clang, and it lets me target these devices, ARM64, ARM32, and this was, this was being done in 2013, right? Wasm has a backend compiler because we use MRuby. We can, make, we can make a WASM game, and this can be deployed to WASM. Raspberry Pi also. We support Raspberry Pi. So the way MRuby works, and uh, there's a little bit of machinery that you have to use, um, you create your Ruby file, and then you run it through mruby-b-o, blah, 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 blah. And what this does is it creates, a, uh, it creates the bit code as a C file. So it converts, converts your Ruby program into to Ruby bytecode, uh, byte and then you compile your application by referencing that bytecode. So you require mruby.h, open it, and then load your bytecode. And you compile your program together, and now you have something that can load up, load up Ruby. So I have a window. I can load up Ruby, but now how do I call it? How do I call this tick method? Okay. And then this is your game loop. So every video game has a game loop. Uh, it's your, uh, we call it a sim simulation loop, and then you're, you have a render loop that does all the rendering. But our simulation loop uh, runs at 60 hertz. So you sleep for 16 milliseconds between each, each loop of your simulation. And here we're using the MRuby um, C API to actually construct a Ruby object. So I, I have my object class, MRB underscore class underscore get of object. And then I call new on it by calling mrb underscore fun call. I love that it's fun, fun call. Um, you take your runtime class or object class. That's a, that's a typo. That should be object class, sorry. You call new on it and it takes in zero arguments. Okay? So I, I have a new Ruby object. It's great. And here's your, here's your event loop for SDL. You pull for events, see if quit was provided. If it is, then you quit. Otherwise, on that object that was created with new, you call the tick function passing in zero, uh, zero arguments. And that's how you invoke Ruby from C. And the cool thing is that you can do all of Ruby from C. You want to create a, you want to create a class, you can define a class that is wired into, um, into C functions. It's literally how Ruby and MRuby are built. Right? You look at array.c, this is what you see there. So this is how it started, right? Here's, here's a little bit of the API. Um, so you have some initialization. We give you this uh, environment parameter called args because pirates. You can call it whatever you want. Um, we have the state variable, which is kind of an open struct that retains your game state across, across invocations of tick. Remember, this is executing at 60 frames per second, right? A set of sprite angle, a spin. We have output options. You pass, you just shovel objects into it. 
If it responds to these values, you can give it a class, you can give it a tuple, a hash, a struct, what have you. Pass it in, this creates a label at this location, this creates a sprite with the angle set to the sprite angle that was defined here. If I press enter, it either starts the spin or stops the spin. And if it's spinning, I increase the sprite angle. So the next time that it comes in, it's retained that state and this value will get updated. So you will see a, a sprite spinning on the screen. Right. And that's what basically powers, where's, where's my, there it is. And that's what powers the screen. So this is running at 60 frames per second. All the ripples, all that is, is being communicated at that rate. Uh, as far as rendering, it's hardware bound. So as far as, uh, as fast as my hardware can render the screen, the scene, it will render it. Okay. So this is how it started. <laughs> it's never how it ends. And, um, and we're getting into the aspect of uh, what is a runtime? When does a library or like a small little, little enhancement to MRuby become more than, more than just an enhancement of MRuby? And um, this is what the Dragon Ruby runtime looks like. Um, I'm not gonna talk through this entire thing. I just wanted to create this thing so I can do some like cool zooming stuff. And again, this is, this is kind of like the cool part of uh, using a game engine to create your slides. Prezi, eat your heart out. It's freaking awesome. That's the only reason I created this thing. But, um, but at a high level, uh, so talking about What's the difference between a language? I mean, like a, a library, a framework, a runtime, a language. Uh, one of the key differentiators of, of a Dragon Ruby is the simulation thread. So um, you think about Node.js having an event loop. Well, this, this runtime instance, the Dragon Ruby runtime, effectively has an event loop, right? So we come in every 16, uh, 60 second, uh, 16 milliseconds and, and run this event loop for you. This gives you an, uh, some nice things. I can aggressively GC for you on your behalf. Because I know your time slice is just that long. I can, drop, I can shut down the VM, do a GC for you, because I know your, run, your code's not running, and then bring it back up. So it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful concept. Uh, asynchronicity is beneficial here too, because you can send out an HTTP request that's an async request, and then you don't have to worry about any kind of promises or callbacks, because the next time you enter, you enter the, this, uh, this tick, you can check to see if the request is finished and then perform processing on it. Completely simplifies this, this idea of uh, uh, um, async, async programming. Fibers would fibers benefit from this also. You have a fiber, you can tick the fiber for one iteration and then come back and tick it again for the next iteration. There's a lot of power there. All right, so that's something that differentiates um, ourselves uh, from, from the rest of the rubies. We've added, expanded the core loop quite a bit. Uh, PhysFS is our file access. You don't have standard lib on a console or web. iOS and Android are different. They're sandboxed. You can't just call file.read. It won't work. It will explode because you don't have the standard lib in, in these environments. So we had to add our own uh, cross-platform standard lib. CVARs for, um, CVARs for configuration, Matrices are LLVM intrinsics. JSON parsing, XML parsing are built in. HTTP is built in. Require did not exist in MRuby. We had to add that. Um, and then we've got a single, uh, single header C libraries that kind of expand on math core libs and some of that other stuff. See, it's already getting boring. It's like, oh God, stop talking. Um, our render thread is hardware bound, which is good. So it, runs, it renders as fast as you allow. This is where we process our textures, audio, shaders, HTTP support for our 2D rendering pipeline. And then, uh, of course, this runs on VR also. So we've got, uh, you can build VR games that are hot loaded in Ruby, which is pretty freaking cool. And I can show you that. Um, so we, we've got a rendering pipeline. Uh, as far as the tool chain, you call this function to package your game and create your, your binaries for Wasm, PC Mac Linux, Raspberry Pi, and then iOS and Android and Oculus. And um, the resulting binary the entire runtime is 4.5 megabytes. The entire thing is 4.5 megabytes, which is, which is kind of insane. Uh, I think our logo, our, our visual assets for the logo and some of the other stuff are actually bigger than the actual runtime. 
Um, but uh, it, it's because we can be so lean and, and uh, because we can leverage the power of Clang and the compiler and the LLVM infrastructure that allows us to do this. Uh, you can expand it. If Ruby's not fast enough, you can create your own fee, uh, foreign function interfaces to see. You pass it through this uh, bind, uh, bind process and it'll create the glue for you so you can invoke those C functions through, through Ruby itself. And finally, we're working on something called Firestorm um, because of course dragons, so the obvious name is Firestorm. You've gotta, you've gotta keep that. We're gonna, we're gonna create a command line based version and we're gonna, have a rake, we're gonna create rake. Guess what we're calling it? Come on, Drake. See, See? it's just, it's so perfect. It's so perfect. Um, but yeah, imagine having, having a cross-platform, zero dependency, X copy de deployable, you can put in a zip drive, run a program that does your build automation for you, right? No, no installations required. So just to speak a little bit about Firestorm. I'm gonna go into my REPL, and um, here's game.rb, right? And uh, we've got this compiler thing where we just dump, uh, dump the stuff to the screen. Okay, so these are the opcodes that you're seeing for that, for that boat, Bodie, Bodie McBoatface game that we were looking at. And um, the really interesting thing about MRuby and how it differentiates itself from uh, the C Ruby runtime is that it's, it's opcode based, but it's register based. So instead of being a stack based virtual machine, it's a register based virtual machine. And the LLVM infrastructure that exists and what Clang is built on and how it's optimized and why it's so fast is because LLVM is a register-based virtual machine. So it uses something called static single assignment. My eyes glaze over usually at this point too. Um, and because of static single assignment, you get, some, you get some optimization from that. It can do some dead code elimination, kind of compress, the, uh, comp compress your opcodes. So because MRuby is register-based and because LLVM is register-based, we have a one-to-one -one mapping to LLVM and their opcodes for the most part. There's caveats with how jumps are handled and while loops. It's tricky. Details, right, hand wavy. But the theoretical aspect is that because, because MRuby is so in line with what LLVM provides out of the box, our JIT ends up being optimization passes provided directly by LLVM, right? So that's, that's this next level that we're, that we're uh, uh, taking, uh, taking the runtime to. And it kind of happened by accident, right? We didn't know that, M I didn't know when I first did my Hello World that MRuby was register-based. But um, it ends up, we'll, we'll be able to greatly benefit from that, okay? So that's, that's the gist of this picture. And we have a whole 12 minutes to talk about fun and cool stuff now. Um, so uh, just, to, just to give you, or we can just leave if you, if you just hate me and you wanna go, that's, that's also fine. Um, so, uh, we have a phenomenal community. Uh, so our, if you go to our Discord server, you're gonna, find, you're gonna find new Ruby devs because they've never done Ruby before and you see the magic again in their eyes. It's just, it's really, really great. It feels good. Um, and uh, some of our community members end up making tweet carts where you just do code golf with, with uh, Ruby and the API. And they're like, hey Amir, can you add this, this instead of calling args.outputs.solids, can we just call it slint? SLD exclamation point. Like, why would you ever want to do this? Because I want to make a tweet card. I'm like, fine, I'll add it. And so we add it. And so this, oh, no, 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 that, I just gave it away. Sorry. This creates this. And this makes this. That makes Ryu's Hadouken. And um, this monstrosity makes breakout. And so there, there's, there's a lot of like, th this is what it goes back to the art, the innovation, right? We're so stuck in our ways with software craftsmanship and the way Ruby exists today, and this is how we're supposed to build software. That we don't have the freedom and the ability to like rethink and play around. And I want Dragon Ruby to, to be that facet, to be that, uh, to be that avenue for, for you to build build things that are just fun and stupid. Okay? All right, 10 minutes for questions. Questions, yes? So you mentioned the community earlier with small parts of the 
That's a good question. So um, I brought up uh, our comparison and performance comparison between Ruby and Unity. And uh, the question was, well, how, how are you getting that speed? And uh, Unity is not able to. And that goes back to that issue that the tool chain and the environment is stagnant. Unity has no competition. They own, they own the space. So their motivation to make it faster, to make it better, is somewhat limited. They'll do what needs to be done to, uh, to build out their environment. And a part of that, a part of the challenge that Unity has is that they've been around for a very long time. They're built off of a mono runtime, which is over a decade old at this point. There's a bit of cruft there. And then they've added features and bloat and more features and bloat, and then you're just left with a lot of heavy stuff in that environment. So because of that, your render pipeline is really, really weighted. Your physics pipeline is really, really heavy. And um, it just builds up. Um, the other aspect is that uh, Dragon Ruby is primarily 2D. We're, not, we're, we're playing around with 3D for VR stuff just because I want to make Space Invaders as a 2D game that comes at me and, and it looks awesome. But we're, we're intrinsically 2D. For Unity, 2D was af added after the fact. So all those things kind of add up and you're, just, you're left with the hodgepodge of, of what's possible. And because uh, because we, we said, okay, we want to be lean, mean, we're right against the metal with SDL, that allows us to be as fast as we are. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, what are what are some games that are built with Dragon Ruby that uh, y'all have probably played but don't know that you've played? Um, so uh, I am. Uh, I used to be able to say that I'm the only Ruby game dev, but now we've got thousands of us, which is great. Um, but as far as my commercial uh, commercial games, I have uh, my air quotes claim to fame. Uh, where's where's the browser? There it is. So um, Rajan.net. So these are the titles that I've built uh, using, using Dragon Ruby. Uh, the biggest one would be uh, A Noble Circle. Um, it, was, it was actually published about in the New York Times. So it was the best-selling iOS game back in 2013. I've been to this, this page way too many times. <laughs> uh, wait, here's New York King. New Yorker. Yeah, A Dark Room, the best-selling game that no one can explain. So um, uh, across all my titles, uh, I'm at 3.1 million downloads and sales and stuff. And um, uh, I've got four or five games uh, on top of that. Of course, uh, A Dark Room. That's our, that's our Discord server. They're awesome. You should go there. Um, a Dark Room Ninten Nintendo Switch. There we go. So yeah, and this is, this is on the Nintendo Switch right now, which is perceivable. But um, usually when I get that question, they'll say, well, what about games that other people have built? And I'm like, Okay, if you want that, I, I don't have anything at that point. Right. But, um, but yeah, I want y'all to be able to build this stuff. I want y'all to be able to explore. Y'all are gonna be the next. You're, I want you, y'all need to be the big studio, right? I'm, I'm just the small guy that builds stupid little things and, and trolls people. So, yes. That's a good question. So, so how do you get started with, with Dragon Ruby, or even begin to get into game development. Um, so uh, you, wanna, you wanna download the engine, right? So you do uh, dragonrubyitch.io, and um, like I said, it's, it's, available, uh, it's available on sale, zero through the conference. You get a zip file, you double click to unzip it, and in there there's a, there's a 100 plus sample apps that kind of incrementally get you through through putting a label on the screen to something you know, fairly, exam, uh, uh, fairly advanced. So if I, one of my sample apps rake, uh, this is my local dev environment, which is why I'm just staging a sample app. I think it's called Moving. Moving a Sprite, cool. So there's a sample app called Moving a Sprite. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad that worked. And that's all it is. All right, so it shows you how to move a Sprite, okay. Um, after that, we've got more advanced reference implementations. Um, so this is a full-blown game that's available in the, in the engine itself. So a bunch of reference implementations. I'm pretty good at this game. 
Just kidding. That felt, that was great, it was great. So I'm just gonna go to Calc Game Over. Return. <laughs> Take that game. What are you talking about? See, I'm, I'm freaking fantastic at this thing. I can do this with my eyes closed, it's great. So uh, we've got a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, sample games in there also. and. Um, the, uh, the sample apps are ordered uh, by simplest to increasing difficulty. So you just start at the directory with zero, zero, underscore, and then work through it. Um, Lori, uh, right here in the, in the front row, um, she's, uh, she's got uh, dragonruby.school, which is, which is your, your nice, you know, guided, guided video series on, on how to build video games. So a lot of options there. And, and I mean, a part of it is like Ruby, Ruby is one of those places where the community is, is kind. So come to the Discord. We're always there to help. Lots of people there to help. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yes? Um, you said that uh, it invokes C as well as Ruby. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at Ruby, like how much does it take to increase? And will we still see the same sort of performance uh, benefits that you started That's a good question. So uh, the question is that uh, we're, we're currently in 2D. We're moving into 3D. What impact do we have on performance? How does it affect the complexity of your game? What does that all look like? Okay. And um, uh, this is something, so this exact game that you, uh, that you saw there for Flappy Dragon, I'm gonna, I, I swear he wasn't a plant. So I'm gonna bring up the, uh, the VR version of this. Uh, so we've got a local, uh, uh, We've got a simulation environment for, for VR. It's not perfect, you can see that it kind of does horrible scale and whatnot. So here's the game running in VR. And as far as the sprites, you have an additional property, which is the Z property. So you can take a 2D game and still fail miserably at completing it. Um, uh, you can take your 2D game and make it an Oculus game. And then what you're seeing here is that these are all just sprites, but they have an X and Y rotation. And then um, we let you we let you walk around the the actual like the actual uh, uh, space so you can see yourself dying from behind. Um, and um, and that's kind of how we're taking it. So would you would you make uh, would you make the next uh, Final Fantasy remake in this? No, I would not recommend that. But can you start playing around and, and making like a, a nice little uh, you know charming little. Uh, VR game, absolutely. Right. And that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to explore. Let's see where we can go with this. Let's see how we can innovate. But uh, we'll be fast, we'll get there. One minute, 45 seconds, any other questions? Yes? I'm glad you enjoyed it. Sure, so um, um, I actually have someone that's played one of my games in the audience, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> no one ever buys anything at full price. It's like, I gotta put it at like 69, 67 cents for anyone to pick it up. Um, so um, the development process for, uh, for a dark room, especially for the Nintendo Switch, was exactly why I created Dragon Ruby. I, I don't wanna compile, move it to a device, deploy it there, run it, and go through that process. So um, uh, the, the uh, machinery in Dragon Ruby allows for remote hot load. So you can, put, you can have your game running on your device, save a file, and it will update on the device. And um, uh, you can, uh, if you've got a Steam, you can see that, you can actually see that in action with the, uh, with the um, um, standard license. And uh, that's kind of how it evolved it. So you just, you start with just the simplest pieces of the game, single file, get some things on the screen, play around with it. You've got this live environment where you can use the REPL to change and invoke functions to take yourself back if you make a mistake. And that, that's kind of the iteration process uh, with, with respect to video games. So um, one thing I want to do is make sure the visuals look good. So we, you got a logical resolution of 720p. You don't have to worry about, we handle all the HD scaling and stuff. So you know that 00 is at the bottom left and 1280 by 720p is at the bottom, uh, 1280 by 720 is at the top right. 
and then you build out your game from there. And so um, it, it's just that iterative life process that we kind of expect from Ruby. And that's kind of how it feels. You get a lot of happy mistakes with that live environment. You're like, how the, why did that happen? And then and, uh, a lot of inspiration there. It's really nice. You got to try it. It's fun. All right, we're out of time. Um, I've got stickers. I've got stickers. <laughs> the, the stickers get the clap, really? <laughs>